anxiety. Man, is that not a challenging thing to deal with? It's really an epidemic at this point. After we came out of COVID and everything going on in the world, anxiety is building and building. Psychiatrists say that some of them aren't even taking new clients because people are in dealing with anxiety. What about things happen in our life that they're affecting and, and causing issues in our life or, or are we leaning into those issues and we're actually affecting our world around us. That's some of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. Here, welcome from Pure Heart Church's studios. I'm Pastor Matt, so glad you joined us. We're gonna jump into a little bit of worship and then into Dan's sermon. Welcome to church. I know it's 
it's not much I've nothing else before a king Except for heart singing Hallelujah Hey everybody, welcome to our online campus. We're so glad you joined us today. Shout out to everybody around the world, around the country, around the state of Arizona. And Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys. Tell Pastor Todd I said hi today. Ask him if he's had any donuts this morning. I know, he looks like he's in great shape. The man eats way too many donuts. So here we go. Who's ready for an attitude adjustment today? Now, if you're over 40 and you heard attitude adjustment when you were a kid, that meant it was spanking time. If you're under 40, um, that meant, oh no, it's time out time, right? And today, if you're a child and you need an attitude adjustment, it means it's conversation time. And we're gonna have a conversation about your big feelings. That's what it means today, your big feelings, all right? So the last two weeks, we've been looking at the Apostle Paul's amazing attitude in his letter that he wrote to the Philippian church. Have you ever caught yourself grumbling about your life and then you met someone who was in worse shape than you and they just had joy? That's Paul to me. He's abused. If we could have seen his body, it would probably have been covered in scars from the abuse, of beaten with rods and rocks thrown at him and all the pain that he had gone through. He's wrongfully in prison. He had every right in the natural to have a bad attitude, to have big feelings, if you will, yet he's full of joy. And every chapter of this letter, he talks about Joy. So here we go, week three. Time to deal with our big feelings, everybody. Here's what we're going to talk about. Our third attitude adjustment in this series. Here it is. We need to become a catalyst, not a sponge. If you're in a place where you can say this out loud, let's do it. A catalyst, not a sponge. Now, watch what a catalyst means or the function of a catalyst in science, specifically chemistry. The definition is this. Any substance that increases the rate, the rate of reaction without it itself being consumed. Uh, even the human body runs on catalysts. Many proteins in our bodies are catalysts called enzymes, right? Or science guy Dan Steffen today, here we go. Which do everything from creating signals to move our limbs to digesting the food that we eat. These enzymes are so powerful, they can even break down a Kit Kat bar. <laughs> or whatever thing you eat that you know is not good for you, right? A ho-ho, whatever those things are, some kind of Swiss chocolate cake. We know they're not good for us. We just keep eating them. And these enzymes help break them down so that that food that we eat we know is bad for us doesn't instantly kill us, all right? A catalyst changes what's around it without it be itself being changed. That's what a catalyst is. It, it changes whatever is around it without itself being changed. A sponge, on the other hand, takes on the flavor and smells of whatever it is that it surrounds. You put a sponge in a refrigerator, it'll soak in all the odors and smells from that refrigerator and will smell just like your nasty broccoli in your refrigerator that you haven't eaten because it's good for you, all right? Because you've been eating too many chocolate cupcakes. Here we go. It's so easy right now for Jesus followers to be more like sponges, to take on the odor and the flavor of the culture around us, to become angry and bitter and selfish and pessimistic and rude. We're just kind of, a lot of Jesus followers right now, we're just kind of soaking in the culture around us, even our culture's values, if you will. Now, John Maxwell, in one of his great books that he wrote years ago, 17 Principles, um, he always has a book that's like 21 Irrefutable Laws or 17 Principles. He's just a great leadership coach. And I went back and I found seven of his characteristics of a catalyst. This is so good, just watch this for a moment with me. First of all, he says a catalyst is intuitive. Catalysts see things that other people don't see. Secondly, a catalyst is communicative. A catalyst says the thing that needs to be said in order to move an individual or a team forward. Catalysts are passionate. Catalysts feel things that other people don't. They're passionate about what they do, but they're also passionate about who they do life with. A catalyst is initiating. They move forward when other people can't or just won't. A catalyst is responsible. Catalysts carry things that other people won't. They're not consultants. They don't just recommend a course of action. They take responsibility for making it happen. 
A catalyst is generous. Catalysts give things that other people won't. They prepare to use their resources to better other people. Whether that's their time, their money, or sacrificing personal gain, they just are willing to do that. They're just so generous. A catalyst, lastly, number seven, they're just influential. People just want to follow them. They trust them. They're moved by their message and their passion and their generosity and all these things that John just talked about. So that's what a catalyst is. Now, let's take a moment today and let's look at what Paul's catalyst attitude was really like. I mean, here he is in a prison cell, gone through all this kind of all this pain, and yet he's a catalyst. He doesn't become a sponge. He doesn't become like we talked about the last couple of weeks, bitter and angry and angry at the culture and I've been wrongfully accused. I'm not I'm here because a bad people put me here. No, he's not the victim. He has a catalyst attitude. So I'm just going to break this down. I'm not going to go verse by verse, but I'm going to jump all over chapter three, just like I did chapter two and chapter one. So here we go. First of all, Philippians three, verse one, whatever happens, dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And you're like, "Mm, Paul, whatever happens, (laughs) I mean, mean, anything that happens, I should just rejoice. Like when the Rams go from Super Bowl champions to last place, I'm supposed to be excited about that. Or when the doctor says cancer, or when my spouse leaves, or my child's life turns upside down, or when the finances aren't there to meet my bills. Really, I'm supposed to rejoice in the Lord on all things. And what do we do in life when life just doesn't go the way we want? Paul says, I rejoice. But he says, I rejoice in the Lord, not in the pain. I rejoice in the Lord. Paul's not crazy. He's not rejoicing. Oh, man, thank you, God, for all this pain. May I have another, please? You know, another helping of pain, please? No. He's rejoicing in the Lord. Let me me show you his heart on this. Verse 1 continues. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. What, What he's saying is, I'm trying to protect your faith from being consumed by the culture. That's what he wants to do. He wants to protect our faith today. See, the opposite of faith is often worry. And what we worry about the most reveals where we trust God the least. That's just, that's just the truth. I wrestle with this in my own life. Paul had plenty of things to worry about. Being executed, being the most obvious, but he refused to get consumed with his thoughts. He, he refused to let his thoughts consume him. Worry is a sponge filter in our minds. It soaks up more things to worry about. And faith is a catalyst that drives worry out of our mind. God, I trust you, not my circumstances right now. I trust you, God, not my own strength or ability or creativity. How is Paul able to be a catalyst and not a sponge in the midst of this Roman prison cell? With Jesus' followers being burned alive and fed to the lions, how is he able to do this? Let let me show you several mindsets that helped Paul. These are several things that God's spirit put deep in his spirit that helped him. And so I'm just going to jump all over this passage. Here we go. Jump down to verse 13. Paul writes this, but I focus on this one thing. Paul says, I'm forgetting the past and I'm looking forward to what lies ahead. The word forgetting here in the Greek language means to remove out of your mind or another interesting part of this definition, to neglect. And Paul's like, I am really intentional about not ruminating on past pain and staying stuck. I'm I'm neglecting to just dwell on all of these things in my life that have gone wrong for me or the pain that I've walked through. I'm just not going to let my mind stay there and stay stuck. Paul understood that God has a plan in all of this. He's working it out. He's working towards the good. Something purposeful, powerful is coming in his life. He just trusts God. Verse 14, Paul continues. He says this, I press on. If you can say it out loud, if you're in a place to do it, do it. Come on, press on. Say it again. Press on. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. He's like, I'm living for a life greater than this life. I'm not getting all I want in this life, but my hope isn't dependent on this life. I may not be getting everything that I think I deserve right now, but my hope is not built in this life. I know that God has something better for me. Paul understood this statement, and it's one of my favorites. I used to have a big old um, poster in my house that had this statement on it. It says this, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds my tomorrow. That's so good. Can we just say it together? Ready, go. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds 
my tomorrow. Paul gets so real now in this chapter. He starts talking about his enemies and people who are enemies of the cross. He gets really emotional. Matter of fact, at one point he says, I say this to you now, I write this to you now with tears in my eyes. He says, many are the enemies of the cross. But now watch his perspective about these enemies of the cross. Verse 20, he says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return. It's so good. He's saying, we stay strong because this life is not God's final answer. Now, now watch this next verse, verse 21. This is a powerful perspective. He says this, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into his glorious, into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Paul's like, hey, Paul knows that when Jesus returns, he will put everything right that is now currently wrong. All the things right now that bother you in our culture today, all the things that upset you, all the things that are so far away from God's word, listen, God will make everything right. Life's not fair, but God is just. He is a God of justice. It will all be made right. Our citizenship is not in this life. Our citizenship is in heaven, and my hope is there. This is not God's final answer. Paul understood that, so he didn't get stuck in his mind in this life. He knew that God was gonna take care of all the injustices that he was going through. See, if we're awake at 1 a.m. in the morning, I promise you this, we're not thinking about how blessed we are. No, we're worrying about something or someone. And now, worry and anxiety are a little bit different. Let's talk about this for a moment. Worry is more specific. Worry is like, I'm worried about my health. I'm worried about my my blood results. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about money. I'm worried about school. I'm worried about the price of meat. Can I get an amen from anybody today? Worry is in our minds. Anxiety is in our body. We feel it. It affects our whole body. It affects us in so many different ways. It affects our immune system. We get sick. We get tired. We get run down. We feel anxious. We just feel anxious in our bodies. You know that feeling when anxiety is in your body. You can just feel it. Now, worry and anxiety kind of overlap each other a little bit, but anxiety is focused, man. It's it's specific. Anxiety is just all-consuming. And I know Paul had to wrestle with both worry and anxiety. Now, a catalyst is a person who has concerns. It doesn't mean we don't walk through this life and have some concerns, but they're not consumed with worry. See, a concern is an action word. Concern says, there's something I'm going to do about this. I'm not just going to sit here. I'm not just going to sit here stewing about doing. I'm going to actually do something about what I'm wrestling with. Paul said, I I press on. That means I'm gonna eat better. I'm gonna pray more. I'm gonna read read God's word more. I'm gonna get counsel. I'm gonna take inventory of my life. I'm gonna push past offense. That's what a catalyst does. It doesn't mean that catalysts don't have concerns that can turn into worry. It's that a catalyst said, you know what? No, I'm gonna be proactive on this. I'm gonna give this to God. I'm I'm gonna do the right things that I know I've been doing wrong, the things I've been doing wrong. I'm gonna turn those to right actions. Besides, hear hear this, please hear this. 91% of what we worry about never happens. That's actual research, scientific research. 90% of what we worry about never happens. The problem is it robs us of our peace 100% of the time. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. So you're telling me there's a 9% chance that this thing could go wrong, all right? Because when I heard that, when I read that quote, I read that stat, I was like, oh, so there's a 9% chance that what I'm thinking about could actually be a problem. Jesus said, look at the birds. They don't worry. And look how God takes care of them. I mean, birds just kind of fly around eating bugs, and then they fly back to the nest, and they kind of chill out for a little bit, and they're in their, in their little nest crib, and then they go out and they eat some more bugs, and then when it gets dark, they go back to the nest and they go to sleep. Birds aren't up at 1 a.m. in the morning pacing around the nest, rubbing their little wings together, worried about bug supply chain. They're just not doing that. Look how God takes care of the birds, Jesus said. Think about how he'll take care of us, his very own creation, his very own children made in his image. Now, verse 1 Paul says that we are to rejoice. And the Greek word for rejoice is very, very interesting. It's a word that means calmly happy. Not in everything rejoice, like in everything. Even in the pain, just be like, woo, this is exciting. I'm so glad I'm having pain. No, he's like, even in that pain, pain, it's like, 
shh, I'm going to be calmly, shh, quiet my soul and find joy in the midst of this. And the joy comes from that perspective that, man, this isn't God's final answer. He's more than able to bring me through this. He's got a purpose and plan in all of this. He's going to work this out. Uh, when we brought Olivia, this beautiful little baby girl that we have the privilege of being guardians for home from the hospital, the first thing that I had to do was buy a shush machine. And I know many of you out there, if you raise kids or you have kids now, you know what a shush machine is. I didn't. It had been 18 years since I raised a child. So um, I had no idea what that was. So I go into the store and there's a guy there. He's like in his 60s. He's helped me out. He's like, I need a shush machine. Oh, they're over here. And he's kind of staring at me like, what is this guy by? He goes, are you a granddad? And I go, no, no. He says, oh, okay. He just keeps on going. So, oh, here they are. And he gave them to me. And he finally, he just couldn't take it anymore. Curiosity was killing him. And he, he looked at me and goes, how old are you? And I go, 53, and he goes, good for you, good for you. I didn't have the heart to tell him I was just a guardian, you know, not some rich guy with a really young, old rich guy with a really young wife. No, I'm a middle-aged guy with a hot Italian middle-aged wife is what I am, and we are guardians of an amazing child. Now, this shush machine was important because this shush machine was there to calm Olivia from the trauma that she had faced of being born on fentanyl and spending 29 days in ICU on morphine and coming off of this drug fentanyl. And so we would put this machine next to her bed and it just goes, shh, 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 shh. And I think that's what Paul's saying to us through this passage. He's just like, rejoice in the Lord, not woo, but like, shh, shh. Just be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is in control. And for some of you listening today, you might be in the middle of trauma. You, you don't know how long it's going to last. Or for some of you, you see trauma coming, maybe with your job or with finances or with your kids, or maybe you're worried about it coming into your marriage. And God today is just going, shh, shh. Just be still and know that I'm God and that I hold your tomorrow. I know you're concerned about it. I know you're worried about it. I know your body's full of anxiety about what you see. Shh. I hold your life together. I promise you I have a plan in all this. And I hold your tomorrow as well. So just, Paul says, trust him in this. This is how Paul can be a catalyst and not a sponge. Um, I look at the economy these days and I get concerned. I have my concern. I have some concerns about even the, our church family financially. And <clears throat> what will this inflation do to our church family? You know, how's it going to impact us, the vision, the things that we want to do? And God just goes, shh. I got your tomorrow, Dan. I gave you the vision. I'm going to give you the provision. I'm going to take care of you. I see uncertainty with the future politically, um, especially as a church. Will our religious rights be infringed on eventually? And I get concerned about that. And God just goes, shh. I birthed pure heart and I will bring it to completion. It's not yours to worry about. It's yours to turn over to me and trust me with. And then I think about my son, Josh, who's stepping back into ministry and really feels like God's called into ministry. And I look at where this culture is going and this world is going. And I know the things I've gone through as a leader in this culture in the church, but I can't imagine what it's going to be like for Josh and the young leaders on our team 10, 15, 20 years from now, what kind of pressures they're going to face from the culture as they stand for Jesus. And I get concerned about that. I'm like, son, don't you want to go into business? Is there something else you can do? You'd be amazing in sales. And God just goes, hey, dad, shh. Stop. The other day, one of our young leaders on our team, Micah, uh, oversees our young adults ministry. He sent me <clears throat> this picture of this rainbow. There was a little storm that was coming into Phoenix, and he sent me this picture of this rainbow. And he's like, Dan, you got to check this out. And so yeah, we're going to show it right now. Here's some, there's like a B-roll of it. It's like a double rainbow that went over our entire campus. And he sent me a couple extra pictures that showed it going over our Brush Fire restaurant on our Glendale campus. And then another one that ending right over top of our auditorium. And I just remember seeing that and just like, God, when I saw that picture and I just went, it was like God saying to me, shh, I have promised you, Dan, I'm in control. I promise you, I have a plan. My promises, Dan, will not fail. Look at the rainbow, Dan. And it's a double rainbow, Dan. It's a double rainbow. It's a double promise, Dan. Come on. I've got pure heart in the palm of my hand. Now, I want you to watch this next part. I'll just keep moving on. Verse 16. Paul goes on, he says this, but we must hold on to the progress we have already made. This is so good. He says, here's what you have to understand. 
He, he found this statement, uh, I found this statement about catalyst this last week. The statement goes like this. A catalyst sees possibility and steps into it rather than circling around and going backwards. Paul's like, we gotta hold on to the progress we've already made. We can't just keep circling around and going backwards. Paul's like, I refuse to lose ground in my spiritual maturity. I'm not gonna lose ground in my growth. And he's saying the same thing to us today. You've already forgiven that person. Don't allow bitterness to soak back into your marriage, into your friendship, into that working relationship. Don't allow it to happen. You've become generous with your time and money. Don't become angry or afraid of the economy and develop a scarcity mindset. He's like, don't lose the ground that God has already gained in your life. He says, I'm not going to lose this ground. I've watched so many churches stop serving public schools because they've just become angry at the culture. They've become angry at the schools, what they were teaching or how they handled the pandemic. And yes, some kids got hurt. I understand that. And I'm not happy with the way some of the protocols went down in our local schools. I'm, my own daughter was set back two years in her education as she got ready to go to college. And it's been a struggle for her this year. And it frustrates me. But Jesus never told us to only love and serve those that we fully agree with. That's what a social club does. That's what a political party does. That's not what the body of Christ should do. And so I'm watching so many Jesus followers pull away from loving and serving and making a difference in the world around them into their own little huddles and their own little tribe. This a couple weeks ago, I sat down with a Supreme Court Justice here in Arizona. His name is Jim Bean, incredible Jesus follower, great man of God. And we started talking a little bit about foster care and adoption. And I want you to hear a little bit of that interview today and I'll come back right after this and give you some next steps. Check this out. We're here today with Supreme Court Justice Jim Bean from Arizona Supreme Court. And we are just so honored you'd hang out with us today and talk to us about this very important issue of foster care and adoption. Before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about how'd you become a justice in Arizona? I moved to Arizona in 1988 to attend law school. After finishing law school, came up to the Valley to practice law. In 2009, I was appointed to the Superior Court here in Maricopa County. And I served in that role for seven and a half years. That's where four of those seven and a half years, I was on the juvenile court bench. And that's where I saw cases involving issues such as foster adopt. April of 2019, I was appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court where I currently serve as a justice on that court. Just a side note, so you know, I, I did vote yes to retain you as a justice. So I just, I want you to know I did that. I did my part. I, I appreciate right? it. Yeah, I, we, I we need more Christian justices in our in our, in our our state. So. I, you, myself, and my wife, that's all I that's good. That's all I that's expect really, on I did my part. Day, so. Well, my wife did too as <laughs> okay, well. Okay, great. That's good. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about when your heart really got moved for this foster care ad adoption situation we find ourselves in our world today. Tell me a little bit about that. When I went and took the bench as a juvenile court judge, I did not know that at the time there were about 12,000 kids in what they call an out-of-home placements. That's where DCS has come to the realization that there might be some issues of neglect or abuse. So they removed the children from the parents' homes. And again, statewide in 2012, that number was about 12,000 kids wow. in out-of-home placements. I was stunned by that number. I didn't know that that was happening in, in my midst. So once I started to get into those types of cases and really get into the weeds in, in those cases, it, it broke my heart. It broke my heart as a human being, as a father, as a husband, and as a believer. And to think that there's almost 2,000 churches in Maricopa County, and if every church would find people in their church family that would say, you know what, I wanna step up and I wanna give a forever home to these kids. I mean, we could see every kid in the system be either in a foster care home or an adoptive forever family. We really can do this, it's a doable thing. For Nicole and I, we, you know our story I was sharing with you at lunch the other day. We had the opportunity as kinship guardians to receive this beautiful little girl, Olivia, into our life this year and so, Man, I always get so emotional, but there's been few things that God's called me to do that has um, challenged me. <laughs> My ability to like, can I do this at 53 years of age? But also blessed me. I've never been, um, there are a few things that have blessed me more than caring for this amazing little girl. She's, she's changed me in a lot of ways. Our church family knows that. What would you say to um, parents out there today or, or families out there today that would say, Maybe I'm interested in doing that. Maybe I'm interested in being a foster parent. Maybe I'm interested in adopting. What would you say to them? First, ask them to pray about it and, and to seek God's guidance on something like that because it's raising a child. Yeah. 
and it's raising a child that's coming to you in circumstances that aren't great. And these children are traumatized and they come to you that way. So it's not gonna be like having your own biological child that you raise from, from birth. You're gonna get these, these kids with certain issues that you have to be ready for. You have to deal with the Department of Child Safety. You have to deal with the, uh, the court system. You have to deal with lawyers and case managers and everything that goes with that. So first and foremost, I would say pray about it. And, and then, you know, if you feel compelled to do that, then, you know, ask people that are in the system, how do I get started? How do I get licensed? You were sharing with me a little bit about something you discovered recently about what's happening with a number of foster care parents and adoptive parents. Can you talk about that for just a moment? December of 2018, there were about 15,000 kids in out-of-home placements. Right now, there's about 12,500 kids in out-of-home placements. So those numbers are going in the right direction. Right. There's a number, a statistic that isn't going in the right direction, and that's the number of families entering the foster care system. That number is, it has decreased by a few hundred. More families are exiting um, being foster uh, placements than entering the system. And I know there's a lot of families in our church that would be maybe like, I don't know if I get anything more to my plate. But then once I said yes, I realized this was God was in this all along. And he really has to be in it. He has to be the one calling you to do it because it's not easy. So thank you for this time. We're going to have an actually an informational meeting and we would love for you to join us. Uh, it's going to be on Tuesday, November the 22nd at 6 p.m. on our Glendale campus. And if you have any interest at all in being a foster or adoptive parent, would you please, please, please join us that night? You can sign up, you can email, and the email's coming up right now, kfiori at pureheart.org. And Kimmy, a great, wonderful leader on our staff, she'll get everybody signed up and we'll just have a great time. And I'm so glad you're gonna be there that night and you're gonna be sharing with us and giving us more information about how to become foster and adoptive parents and giving us some insights into the system and how it all works. And we're gonna have a great time together making a difference in a lot of kids' lives. So thank you so much for what you do. I appreciate it's it. It's great to have people who are in love with Jesus in our court system, but I just really appreciate your heart. Thanks for your invitation. It's an honor to get to know you. Thank you very much. You bet. It was such a great time hanging out with the, the Supreme Court Justice Jim Bean, and he has such a passion for foster care and adoption, but it, it really broke my heart to think that that many people have pulled out of the foster care sh system, and I think it's just people are just so exhausted, and they're just so overwhelmed these days. So I'm really hoping you'll come to that informational meeting coming up on Tuesday night, if you're able to. If you're in town, those I know we have many of you that watch from around the world and around the country. We understand you can't fly in for that meeting, um, but man, I would encourage you where you live to make a difference. Uh, to get involved in foster care and adoption. Uh, my wife, Nicole, um, she's a catalyst. Few people love people like my wife, Nicole, does. I watched the way that she cares for little Olivia. And, you know, this vision to take care of her started with my wife. And, and she, I, you know, she came to me and says, I really believe that we're supposed to bring her home. And I'm just like, baby, are you sure? Like, you know, we're like Abraham and Sarah, man. We're old. <laughs> I'm 53 years old. I don't know if I want to start over, you know, honey. I said, I'll be 70 years old when Olivia's 18. And you know, if we end up raising her for a life, that could, that could be intense, you know? And my wife's like, no, God told me we're supposed to love this child and we're supposed to take care of her. And I, I watched my wife at, now in her 50s and she's got some things going on. She's got some issues with her neck and she has some nerve issues that go down into her arms. And matter of fact, in the middle of the night, sometimes her whole arms go numb and they go tingly and she can't sleep. And yet she wakes up at dark 30 to take care of this beautiful child. Um, she's just a catalyst. She doesn't allow the pain that she's going through in her life, the things that she's facing. And I could go on and on, but I wanna keep some things private that my wife's facing. But I want you to know that I watched my wife reject being a sponge, taking on the bitterness of why me, God? And why me, God, I'm, I'm trying to serve this beautiful baby and why am I not getting the healing I want right now? Why am I wrestling with this? And, but yet I watch her every day just love Olivia and take care of her. She inspires me. Her love inspires me. She's just a catalyst in this child's life to make sure that Olivia knows you matter. You are here on purpose, and we are going to give you a phenomenal foundation no matter how long we have the privilege of raising you for. I love that about my wife, Nicole. I want to be more like her when I get older. Um, one more perspective from Paul today. This is, this, um, this is my favorite chapter in this book, and I wanna back up now to verse eight. Here it is. Verse eight, Paul's been talking about all the things that could be, that we could, he could boast about and take pride in and all that he's accomplished. He's just going on this whole list of things that he's accomplished in life and all the positions and authority that he had before. He's just going through this whole list of all these great things about his life before Jesus. And then he says this in Philippians 3.8, he says, yes, 
everything else is worthless. He's like, everything I just mentioned about my lineage, where I was as a leader in, in the, of the Pharisees, all that stuff is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else and I count it all as garbage. Paul's one of my greatest inspirations because he walked away from everything this world says matters, like money, position, possessions, authority, accomplishments. He walked away from all that to follow Jesus. And following Jesus brought him pain and prison. Oh, he got to see amazing things and churches planted and all these amazing things that he did. And he wrote a majority of the letters of the New Testament. But oftentimes, no matter how many great things happen in our life, all we remember is those painful things. Because so often we end up being more the sponge than the catalyst. And, and all these things of following Jesus didn't bring him a life free from pain. He went through all kinds of pain, but he refused to be a sponge and he continued to be a catalyst. Now, there's three things that happen. I'm gonna go back to worry for a second. There's three things that can happen to us when it comes to worry. When, whatever you're worried about. And what is that thing today you're wrestling with? What do you worry, is, it, is it a child? Is it, is it your health? Is it your finances? What are you wrestling with today? Let me help you with something real quick. Number one, the first thing that could happen with worry is this. Whatever you're worried about doesn't happen at all. There's like a 91% chance it won't happen. That's the first thing. It, it may never happen. So why keep worrying about it? There's only a 9% chance it could happen. Sorry, I know I triggered some of you right there. Number two, what could happen with worry is it happens but it's not as bad as we thought it was gonna be. You lost that job, but you realized, I was miserable in that job. I just wasn't strong enough to, to step down, to quit and to trust God and move on to something better. And now you've discovered that God actually had something better for you all along. Or maybe that relationship ended and you thought that was the end of the world because they were the one. They completed you, right? They were everything to you. And then you realize, wait a minute, that relationship was toxic. That relationship was actually broken, I didn't realize it, and I was actually in an insecure place and wasn't willing to let go, and I would have stayed in that and I would have been miserable for a lifetime. Second biggest decision we ever make is who we marry. Number one is who we do with Jesus. And God has someone better for you, and God's saying, wait for my best, and it, it happens. That thing you feared the most happens, but it turns out not to be as bad as you thought it was gonna be. Or three, it happens, and it's worse than you thought. But in the midst of that pain, you discover God was able to bring you through it. And what you really discovered is you got to see God in ways you never saw him before. You got to experience him in ways you never experienced him before. And you say, Dan, Dan, easy for you to say, easy for you to say, maybe you haven't walked through, but I've walked through pain. I've been through divorce. My first wife left me for another man. I've been through financial disaster. I lost a home, went almost bankrupt in 2009. I know what it's like to have health crises and health scares. I get it. But I also know people have been through more than me. I've sat with people getting ready to leave this life or the next life who've dealt with cancer and they looked at me and said, you know what, I don't regret anything because I got to know Jesus through this cancer like I never would have before. And I know he's right here with me and I can't wait to see him face to face. You see, Nicole and I have discovered in our lives this, this, this thing and it's so important. We get to know God best when we need him the most. And that's what Paul discovered in this prison cell in Rome. And that's why, by the grace, power, and the love of God, he was able to write this amazing letter that we've been reading the last three weeks. You know, we, I've discovered that in our darkest hour, that Jesus was the most valuable part of my life. Paul discovered in his darkest hour <laughs> that there was nothing more valuable to him than his relationship with Jesus. No thing or person mattered more than Jesus. And that's what we can find if we trust that God holds our tomorrow. If we'll trust that God is up to something working in our circumstances. If we trust that this life is not his final answer. If we'll just surrender that thing that we're walking through, that thing that we worry about to him. We'll get to discover him in ways we never would have been able to without that trial. So let's just take a moment right now, and I don't wanna be flippant with this. And I wanna pray, I wanna pray for two, two situations out there today. Number one, you're walking through difficult things right now. And if you're on one of our, our services where you're able to chat, there's somebody there to chat with you, would you just let them know what you're walking through right now? Because we would love to pray with you. We would love to encourage you. And as a matter of fact, let me just do that right now. Lord, you know everybody that's listening today. You know exactly what they're walking through. 
and you love them. God, would you pour out your grace on them? Would you encourage their hearts, God? Would you let them know that they matter and they're here on purpose and that you're in the midst of all this and that you're gonna bring good out of these bad situations. You're gonna bring healing and provision. Would you meet them right where they are in their pain, Lord? In Jesus' name. And then secondly, I wanna to talk to some people today who maybe for the first time in your life, you're ready to say yes to the leadership of Jesus in your life. You're ready to believe in your heart that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You're ready to confess with your mouth that he is Lord of your life. You're ready to make that ultimate decision, most important decision to say, Jesus, I wanna follow you. For some of you, it's the first time. For others of you, today's more of a rededication of your life to Christ. And so if that's you today, and you're ready to say yes to Jesus, would you just pray with this, this with me right now in your heart? Just pray this, Lord Jesus, in this moment, I trust you with my life. I believe that you are the Messiah, that you are the Son of God, that you died for me. And I ask you to be Lord of my life. Just say that to I ask you to be Lord of my life right now. Lead me, Lord. Heal me, Lord. Fill me with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You made that decision today. We would love to hear about it. We would love to walk with you and encourage you. I pray you have a strong, strong weekend. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving next week. And next week, we'll wrap up this whole series with our fourth attitude adjustment. Bless you guys. Love you. Have a great one. Wasn't that great? So powerful. I think there's some steps that I took away from that that just is going to help me walk through some areas of anxiety that even I've been struggling with in my life. Um, it also was a good reminder about me not allowing my life to be a sponge and soaking up some of the things of the world, but shifting into being a catalyst for change and doing some of the things that God wants us to do and, and to lean into. You know, having tools in our spiritual life is so important. And that's why we as a church have been going through the Rooted series. And I'm gonna shift over to Pastor John to close out the service as he tells you about some amazing things that happened in our last Rooted series. This is baptism weekend here at Pure Heart Church. We love baptism because it is a public profession of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are water baptized, we are telling the world that we have said yes to Jesus, that we have been buried with him in the waters of baptism and coming up out of the waters, we are raised into newness of life to walk in the freedom that Christ has given us. Just the other night at our Rooted Celebration, we had 14 people that had said yes to Jesus that were baptized in water. And we're rejoicing also this weekend with others who have said yes and are taking that important step to be water baptized. Now, if you have not yet been water baptized, but you've said yes to Jesus, we really encourage you to do this. And in order to do it, it's very, very simple. Talk to somebody at the Connection Hub. They'll help you get connected with our baptism class if you're not really clear on what's happening with baptism and what it's all about. We will walk you through it step by step. And then when you get into the water on that day that you choose to be baptized, we will rejoice with you because of what Christ has done in your life. Thank you so much for watching all the way through. We pray that this leaves you encouraged and ready to enter into another amazing week. Don't forget to connect with us via our online connect card found on our website, pureheart.org, where you can give as well to the mission and vision of Pure Heart. Remember, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to pretend and it's not okay to stay stuck. We'll see you guys next weekend.